Um, Josh, you made a comment earlier. We've been talking about your heart, and certainly your heart has been changed. Like you said, it's because of what God did in your heart. You started that humanitarian organization. You're able to forgive that man, forgive your father. But you were doing a lot of research, and you raised your hands, almost like a trial lawyer saying, I give up. Okay, you ran out of evidence to dispute Christ as the Messiah. Would you highlight, obviously we can do 10 shows on this one topic. Actually 100, but go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> Would you highlight some of that evidence that demands a verdict that Jesus Christ is the only way? Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of people in this world that believe that you can get to heaven through Buddha or through Mohammed or through creationism or through all kinds of varying religious beliefs. But there's something about the name of Jesus that's actually not true. The, Jesus went around saying, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one enters my Father's kingdom except through me. That's what he said, but why can he say it? And how can we prove it? I want Josh to address some of those issues. What I had to do was first deal with the scriptures, especially the New Testament, because most of the information that God has revealed about, about his son is in the Christian New Testament. Now, there's many ex extra biblical references, which I've documented in my books, many about Christ, but the, the majority of it is in the scriptures. So I had to ask myself two things, and I was not a Christian. Is if, Could I take the New Testament and hold it in my hand and say what I have is what was written down, or has it been changed? Second, was what was written down true? What do you mean by that? Well, did Jesus actually do that? Did he really say that? Or did somebody add that to it? Did somebody add something additional to the gospel or what Jesus said? And so I set out to examine those two questions. And basically to do that, you apply what's called historiography. Big word, little meaning. Almost all big words have little meanings. <laughs> all it means is the, the principles of determining authenticity of any text historically, mm -hmm. whether the Bible or what. One question it asks is called the bibliographical test. Another big word, little meaning. Not Bible-graphical, bibliographical, like biblioteca in Spanish. And this asks questions of the manuscripts, the handwritten copies. And the first question it asks, what is the timeline from the original to the closest copy? Because you see, if I cannot have total confidence in the New Testament, then I really don't have a confidence in what Jesus said or did, or can I believe him? And the first question is timeline. You see, have the original, and the original always start to deteriorate and fade. The ink will fade, so you do generation number one copy, and then number two ad infinitum. So the question is, how far are the copies that you have removed from the original which is called the autographa. The closer the copies, usually the greater the accuracy. Why would that be? For this reason. Usually the closer the copies you have to the original, the fewer times it's been copied and less chance of human error entering the text. I compare this with other literature of antiquity. With Caesar and the Gallic Wars, 1,000 year gap from the time they're written down in closest manuscript. Euripides, 1,000, a uh, 500-year gap. Aristotle and the Poetics, a 1,400-year gap. Uh, Pliny the Younger, 750-year gap. Aristophanes, a 1,200-year When it comes to the New Testament, we go back within 50 years. And I document all that in my book, More Than a Carpenter and Evidence of Demands Birth. I never knew that. I was dumb. Problem is, others were dumber. They made a movie out of it, dumb and dumber. <laughs> uh, but I never knew that. And then number-wise, you see, the more copies you have, the easier it is to take those copies and recreate the original to what you call a high percentage of a pure text of what the original said with confidence. For example, if you have 20 manuscripts, and, in, and they all contain the Gospel of John, but in John 3, 16, there's three different renderings. Some say, for God so loved the world. Several says, God thought a lot about the world. And several says, God thought the world was cool. How do you know what was the original? You can't with 20 manuscripts. But if you have four or 500, oh, men and women, it's so much easier to reconstruct. Again, comparing with other literature. Uh, Pliny the Younger, 
only seven manuscripts survive. Everything else has been lost. Caesar and the Gallic Wars, only 10 manuscripts. That's all that survived, all of history. Aristotle, 49 manuscripts. Demosthenes, 200. Sophocles, 193. Euripides, about 12. Herodotus, 8. Do you know how many we have of just the New Testament? 24,633. I never knew that. And you can take that, and I document in my books how you can recreate the original to a 99.5% pure text. You want to show how unique 24,000 manuscripts is? Can you tell me what's the number two book in all history in manuscript authority? It's not the Quran. It's not Harry Potter. It's not the Old Testament. It's the Iliad by Homer. Number two, after the Bible, in all history, in manuscript authority. Do you know how many copies? 643. Men and women. Between number one in history and number two, the Bible number one, the Iliad number two, 24,000 difference. I never knew that. So I set out to make a joke of it. And I concluded, I could hold the New Testament in my hand and say two things. What I have is what was written down. But second, what was written down was actually true. Jesus did that, and he said that. And so I first intellectually came to the conclusion, before I ever became a Christian, that I can trust the Scriptures. And then second, is there any evidence? I better cut this short. I could go on for 100 hours here You're on doing this. good, brother. Let's have a marathon sometime <laughs> and just invite me. I love it. We'll be on to the 20th. <laughs> probably the biggest thing that convinced me among probably five major pieces of evidence was the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Folks, I've done over 250 debates in the universities. Many of them centered around the resurrection. And I've concluded one thing. If I reject the evidence for the resurrection, I would have to exercise a blind faith. It takes more faith to reject the resurrection than it does to accept it because of the evidence. I wrote an entire book on it called Evidence for the Resurrection. And let me just conclude with the resurrection with this. One of the greatest legal minds in the history of America, the man who put Harvard Law School on the map, the man who wrote the three great volumes on the laws of legal evidence, which for years were used to evaluate evidence and testimony in the court of law. His name was Dr. Simone Greenleaf from Harvard University. He was an agnostic, always mocking the Christians in his law classes. Well, one year, he had a couple pretty bold Christians, and in front of the entire class, they challenged him to take his three volumes on the laws of legal evidence and to apply those principles to the resurrection. Well, he had to do it to have any integrity. In the process, he became a Christian. He trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. He went on to write a big book like this called The Testimony of the Four Evangelists, subtitled Long, According to the Laws of Legal Evidence Administered in the Courts of Justice. And he said this, The evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ has never broken down in a law court to this day. The resurrection of Christ is one of the best established events of history according to the laws of legal evidence used in the court systems. That and then the prophecies fulfilled in Christ, his miracles, everything. There was so much that convinced me. But the first thing, I had to develop that conviction. Can I trust the scriptures? Because if I couldn't, it all falls apart. Amen.